everyone's a travel writer these days you know so i mean how do you define what writing on travel is and how it's evolved say in the last decade well, everyone has always been a travel writer in that you know in, in the old days it was diaries and postcards and letters yes. now it's online and blogs yeah. but um to me you know fine travel writing is, is a great art and and there are you know as with uh, novels you know not every not every novelist is tolstoy uh, and and there's every level of, of sophistication up to that that peak. Um, ditto with travel writers, and, and you know it's perfectly legitimate to be a, 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 a an Instagrammer writing in sort of uh, uh, you know uh, millennial speak. Uh, <laughs> and over the years, we've had all the greatest travel writers in the year in the world, including B. S. Naipaul, um, Peter Hessler. Uh, we've had some astonishing writers. Yeah. So, um, yes, I think, you know, it, 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 when it, like anything, when it's when it's well done, it's it's a high art form, but it is also something that anyone can um, can, can join. Just like with photography, you know, anyone can take a snap a mobile phone picture. It doesn't mean you're ragged the right. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <it doesn't... laughs> yeah, but, but how would you define good travel writing? I mean, if you just had to put it in a nutshell, just... <laughs> A matter of personal taste and, 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 and what I consider to be great travel writing is different from what other people would. My personal favorite the writer is not well known in India, mm -hmm. a guy who was my great hero for many years, Patrick Lee Fermo, who wrote a book, Time of Gifts. Okay. If you haven't read him and you're interested, download A Time of Gifts by Patrick Lee Fermo and do yourself a favor. Okay. Likewise, Bruce Chatwin in Patagonia, mm -hmm. um, Roman O'Hanlon into the heart of Borneo, Robert Byron. Road to Oxiana. These are great, great books that, that yeah. gave me such pleasure. For myself, travel writing was something I read when I, in my twenties when I was more fleet of foot. I'm now middle aged. I've got three kids, blah blah blah, uh, mm -hmm. a mortgage, uh, and so I don't do the sort of trips I did in my twenties when you know with the things do. I set off in uh, in May and, and came back in October. Uh, and, and, you know, was on the move the whole time. <laughs> that that doesn't go on anymore. But uh, it's often weekends away or weeks away. But last year I had one of my my favorite trips ever to Cambodia, a uh, wonderful country, unforgettable. Also to Indonesia. Um, and uh, uh, books give you a very good excuse to get away and travel. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for all the recommendations. Definitely going to follow them. Also, Thank you, um, <laughs> I mean, through your own writing, you've you know literally taken people across the length and breadth of India. I mean, you know, there's so much travel that you have undertaken, and so you know when you first started traveling across the country. I mean, I know you came in 1984, and within five years you were actually living in India. But you know, what was the one place that maybe sparked that interest? You know, when you came in and you, I can you tell know, you, there's so exactly. much. You know, I yeah. remember arriving at dawn off a bumpy night bus at Mandu. Oh. Uh, in Madhya Pradesh, and it was, uh, I suppose, a February morning with that slight cool in the air, mm -hmm. uh, and driving up that great gorge up onto the plateau of Mandu and seeing these astonishing ruins mm -hmm. falling into decay with, with you know, beautiful walls encircling the hills and these sort of pa palaces that looked like they were out of some uh, 19th century explorer's uh, book. Uh, I remember the oh Lord, you know, I'm, I'm lost to this country now, and there's no going back. And I remember that evening, standing on the parapet and watching the fruit bats come like a black army of vampires, or something <laughs> overhead. Uh, and, and that I remember was the moment I, 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 I was lost to India, and I, I'm still, I'm really still on that year off now. I'm still. The, 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 <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I, I, I actually got goosebumps with your description of the morning in Mandu. <laughs> yeah. Because I've been to Mandu myself and it's, it's, I know how magical it is. Yeah, absolutely magical, exactly. So also, I mean, you know, you're you're so familiar with, you know, so many languages, Urdu, Persian. I mean, you, you also look up historical records all the time for your writing and uh, your own ancestors were part of, you know, key moments in Indian history. So when you're writing, I mean, you're so deeply immersed in the country. I mean, how do you kind of keep that objective? You know, you kind of uh, separate yourself from the subject that you're writing. Well, 
travel writing is entirely subjective. Uh, I, I wouldn't claim for a minute that uh, any of my travel writing was objective or even pretended to be. It's a personal one, one man's view. Sure. With history, you do try and distance yourself a little, but your opinions, of course, will always show and, and, and you can always tell pretty quickly with a historian, whether they're from the left or the right, you can tell whether they're, uh, uh, whether they're, uh, in terms of Indian history, you know, massively pro-Mughal or massively anti-Mughal. Uh, and so historians may try to be objective, but uh, you can pretty well, uh, within a few pages, see where they're coming up. And that's fine. You, you know, the, the historians should try to be objective, but uh, the, the, these prejudices will sh shine through and uh, and the, the reader has to be aware of that. Yeah. Um, True. But I think well, that's in a sense one of the things that makes a good historian, you can tell the, the enthusiasms, which is the B-side of that. You can tell when things are really um, uh, uh, lighting him up or lighting yeah, her like up. Capturing uh, his imagination. Yeah. 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 And that's the moment of ignition that, that brings the reader in and, and, and makes the narrative come alive. Thank you. Also, I mean, I know spectators, uh, they've listed you as among the world's top thinkers, you know, just a couple of years ago. So when you're, I mean, I, I was just trying to wonder, you know, when you're traveling, it can be, travel can be physical travel, it can be travel through archives, but it's also a very mental thing. So, you know, how much of the travel is in your mind, you know, I mean, when you're actually thinking of a book or you're you know, kind of conceptualizing your next book, uh, how much of it is just internal? I think if you're traveling to write, um, uh, rather than just traveling for relaxation or you know, to, to yeah. escape from the tedium of home or whatever it is, yeah. um, it, you need to prepare yourself. You need to educate yourself in what you're about to see. Because if you travel, we, we all travel in, in, a, in a degree of ignorance. Uh, whenever we go to somewhere new, and that's the excitement. You you know, you, you fill in the gaps and you begin to understand the place. But if you can read some good travel books, and some history books and some politics before you arrive, say last year I went to Cambodia, you know, for the previous six months, I've been reading about Angkor Wat and uh, <laughs> yeah. and And, you know, it completely changed my understanding of what I saw. Uh, and rather than just, you know, magnificent piles of stone, I was able to understand that these were Hindu temples or Buddhist monasteries and uh, that they came from an extraordinary hydraulic civilization where the cultivation of rice had uh, allowed vast numbers of people to to uh, gather in one place and, and create one of the great urban environments of history um, but if you you need yeah you need it, there's a strange sort of thing with travel writing I think that on one hand you need to have the eye of someone that's just dropped in you need to have those vivid first impressions that a, that a, a newcomer can bring to something because you see things you don't see at home. If you're used to home, you 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 you, you, you know, you going to London will see the red pillar boxes and the and double decker buses and the and all the things that I no longer notice because they're just everyday to me. So you need that, but you also need a degree of understanding to interpret what you see. And if you arrive completely dropped off off, uh, off the moon, you know, in, in a place without any knowledge, you will misunderstand what you see. So it's getting that balance right, I think, the right. It's a fine balance, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So also your photography is uh, suddenly, you know, taken off in a big way. You've been doing photo exhibitions in London and uh, even in Delhi a few years ago. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've always taking photographs but what suddenly you know spurred you know having exhibitions so what's always... your instagram yeah <laughs> thank you <laughs> I, I love i love photography and it was very much part of my childhood and youth um and at school i was a photographer that's what people I mean, everyone knew me at school remember me the guy with the camera that was coming out of the dark room stinking uh, of fixer and developer your generation will not understand what that means but in the old days when we used chemicals you could immediately tell when someone would be printing a photograph because you smelt a fixer that was this very pungent acrid smell mm -hmm. um and it was the discovery of editing tools like snapseed a free free app from from um uh google that made me realize that you could recreate you know those black and white pictures from the dark room very quickly on your phone 
uh, and so I, I'm, you know, I'm not a photographer. I'm, a, I'm very much an amateur and, and a writer is what I am. But it's I, I love taking photographs, and it uses a different political brain. You know, uh, writing is is a very slow process where you write, rewrite, edit, rewrite again. Photography is of the moment. It's the instant. It's and if you miss that instant, it's it's, it's missed forever. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's visual. So it's it's it complements very, very well. And when I'm researching one of my books, I take lots and lots of photos. Um, but I'm not a doctor. I wouldn't claim for a minute to to be a a, a serious photographer. Uh, I'm really there. I take all of my mobile phone these days. Although I have a lovely contact that's allowed, it hasn't left the cupboard for two years. Um, I've got a podcast yeah. called Empire. Yeah, uh, and uh, that now has over a million downloads a month. So um, I would, anyone that's interested in uh, that's enjoyed my history books or is interested in the history of, of the, the, the Raj, the East India Company, the British Empire in India, partition, the freedom struggle, uh, all these sort of subjects will we'll find much fodder on Empire Pod. Very interesting. And tell us a little more about The Golden Road, your next project. Um, the Golden Road is a departure for me because I have finished the company quartet that's kept me going 20 years. For the last 20 years, I've been immersed in the 18th century and the story of this bizarre tale of how one London corporation in one office block took over the richest country in the world. It's an unprecedented historical story. But I've now gone back to my first love, which is art history and archaeology. And the Golden Road is all about how India's spiritual, cultural, artistic influence radiated outwards. So part one is the story of Buddhism going up through Pakistan and Afghanistan to China. Part two is the maritime route to Southeast Asia and how Hinduism and Buddhism both traveled along that route. So that the largest Hindu temple in the world is not in India, it's in Cambodia. And then finally, um, the story of how Indian numbers astronomy and mathematics went westwards first to Baghdad, then to the west. So we use what we call in the West Arabic numbers are in origin Indian numbers. Yes. You know that. People in the West yeah. don't. <laughs> <laughs>